All right, welcome to Arguing the Operational Environment, episode number four. And this is uh, part three of the special uh, uh, series on design. And uh, today's focus is going to be on uh, system think systems thinking. And uh, last time I showed you a real world example of uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, John Richardson, the squadron commander in Iraq 2008 2009, uh, commanding 5 4 Cap, and how he used the design ethos to his advantage. Now, he didn't talk about design or he didn't talk about any of the specific things we discussed but the story that he told in another tort paper from the Strategic Studies Institute uh, was uh, jived perfectly with what we do in terms of uh, design and specifically the design ethos. Today, I'm gonna give you a, an actual example of how a commander, uh, this time then Lieutenant General uh, David Rodriguez, who was a commander of ISAF Joint Command, how he looked at the operational environment in terms of uh, systems thinking. Okay, so when, when General Rodriguez talked about the uh, operational environment, he, uh, he talked about it, uh, he said, in Klauswitzian terms. Well, we, we talked about the population, and the, the Afghan uh, population. He talked about uh, the Afghan government. And he talked about the Afghan security forces. This is the army and the police. And what he was trying to achieve was a tight relationship between the Afghan government, security forces, and the population. And this to him, conceptually, and we'll talk about more about this later on in a future episode, conceptually, this is what General Rodriguez was trying to effect in Afghanistan and, and help along. So that the coalition forces, and he was working at the operational level, uh, ISAF uh, Joint Command, the coalition forces were there to support uh, the Afghan government and to support the Afghan population and then through the Afghan government support the security forces to build this uh, trinity. But there was a problem and the problem uh, that we have is that, uh, let me get a red marker here. The problem we had is that there were enemies of the Afghan people, what General Rodriguez called enemies of the Afghan people. And this, this included uh, insurgents. And there are many kinds, uh, many different types, uh, many groups within them, but we'll leave it at that for right now. The insurgents were the most obvious obstacle uh, that were preventing the uh, coalition forces of the Afghan government from achieving the desired end state of a stable, secure Iraq. But there were other enemies of the Afghan people, and uh, among these were uh, poor uh, leaders amongst the uh, security forces and amongst the government. Now, there are many great leaders in Afghanistan, from the top level all the way down. But there were also many poor leaders. Uh, and they were poor for two reasons. Either they were corrupt, and they preyed upon the people, or they were inept, and they didn't know how to do their jobs. In either case, uh, they provided an, they, they were one obstacle, a second obstacle to achieving a, our end state. There was another uh, uh, enemy, and there is another enemy. Criminal patronage networks, CPNs. And you can think of these, and uh, General Rodriguez thought of these as simply uh, mafia organizations. They were also preying upon the population and what convenient uh, collaborating with the insurgents in, uh, in, in uh, working against the Afghan government. Okay? And then finally, the fourth enemy of the Afghan people are uh, uh, bad international practices. And so what happened is that, there, that we wanted a strong trinity here, but it's something we had to achieve and work for. It, today, it still doesn't exist. But what we do see is that there is cooperation between the insurgents, the poor leadership, the criminal networks, and the international community in terms of counterproductive uh, practices, many of them unintentional, many of them well-intentioned, but they led to bad effects. So what's an example of this? Well, uh, one of the worst examples of dumping money into Afghanistan that uh, General Rodriguez talked about was, uh, was the following. He'd say that on the economy, in the Afghan economy, it would cost uh, thirty to $40,000 to build uh, a schoolhouse had, with about three or four uh, room, classrooms in it. There was one instance where we paid $600,000 for a schoolroom house of that size. $600,000, which means that we're effectively dumping 
about $560,000 into the economy that otherwise wouldn't be there. That money undoubtedly goes partly to the criminal networks because they and the money lords know how to seek it out. Some of this money then makes it to the insurgents to help them build their capacity for defeating the, the, the for a, a breaking the link between the Afghan population and the government and the coalition forces in the Afghan government. And then some of it, either because of ineptitude or corruption, some of this uh, money was going to uh, the poor leadership in Afghanistan. So what we have is well-intentioned in the international community that dumps $560,000 into the economy that otherwise wouldn't be there. It then has a feedback effect by strengthening the networks, strengthening the insurgents, and strengthening the hand of the poor leaders. What all this does is further break the confidence that we're trying to establish that the, that the population has uh, for the Afghan government security forces, because now the enemies can do their job better. Another example of a bad international practice is uh, civilian casualty or SIDCAS. General Cristo used to talk about counterinsurgency math. We kill, two, we kill uh, uh, ten, uh, uh, two insurgents, so we have 10, we killed two of them, should have eight, but what we did is we also killed about three or four innocent people, which means the number of insurgents actually goes up. We now have 15 or 16 insurgents because of the counterproductive effects of, uh, of uh, inflicting civilian casualties. Well, what happens there? Well, someone in the population who was thinking about supporting the coalition forces in the Afghan government now, because he has three or four relatives who are killed, will then support the insurgents, which then further further weakens uh, this uh, House Blitzian trinity here that General Rodriguez was trying to affect. This is a system's view of what's going on in Afghanistan. This is the way General Rodriguez understood Afghanistan. But he also applied the system's view when thinking about interventions. Okay, so here, as a quick example, one of the things that we do to defeat the, uh, to defeat the uh, uh, foreign enemies is, uh, just some of the examples, is we'll intervene here by trying to destroy C2, the command and control networks of the insurgents. We'll try to uh, intervene here by helping the Afghan security force and government know that there's corrupt leaders and inept leaders among the ranks and that they need to, we put pressure uh, on the Afghan government security forces to remove these leaders. We also support uh, anti-corruption uh, practices uh, um, in, in, ICE, in the International Security uh, uh, Assistance Force in Afghanistan to defeat the criminal networks. And then here, we introduce uh, contracting guidance. So not only do we look at the environment and the enemy in terms of a system, we also look at intervening in the environment in terms of the system view. Now when you step back and you look at it, this gets pretty messy. There's actually an example in the news called the, uh, the spaghetti, uh, uh, the spaghetti uh, diagram, which tries to talk, uh, uh, describe what's going on in terms of dynamics in Afghanistan. This is what we call in doctrine, in army doctrine, is a working diagram. This is meant to give the staff and the commander a focus to allow them to argue, to collaborate in dialogue, to have a competition of ideas about what the four questions that we talked about in the very first design episode. What you generate is a working diagram. This isn't intended for the commander to share with unified action partners. It isn't intended for him to help describe the operational environment. It's too messy. What then uh, we have to do after this is we need to convert it to something called a presentation diagram. And in a couple of episodes, I'll discuss, uh, uh, I'll offer many examples of what these look like from some of our top leaders. Thank you.